Yes, yes, yes. Can you just help me plug sure. this in? Absolutely. Uh, and using the frame, zoom and the selfie in the layer. That's not the same. Huh? That's not the same. Yeah, I tried to connect, but it, it didn't. Yeah, I'll resend it again. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, I mean, it's not a problem here, but maybe for people <laughs> because you, you had only three people on the on, on the page. More, more. Just need to share the screen. Yeah, let me see the look at the one. So it's my pleasure to announce our second speaker, Rashmi Parida uh, from uh, TJ Watson, uh, IBM TJ Watson Research Lab. Rashmi will tell us about the uh, applications of TDA in life sciences. Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I'm very happy to be here. And um, I'll talk about uh, applications that I have been doing of TDA on problems from life sciences. Um, I lead the computational genomics group at, um, at IBM Research. And I'm, I also chair the exploratory life sciences, hence my leaning towards most problems in life sciences. And uh, uh, that's kind of my focus, that uh, I need to solve problems there um, using tools. And I'll show you examples of uh, topology in, in this uh, talk. So I just wanted to set the stage. I see data in two colors. Okay? Either your data exists on a on a coordinate space, point cloud, so there is some notion of, you know, it could be a high dimensional space, it exists there, or the data is all about relations. And uh, so this is, uh, I'm showing you a graph, but you can imagine you can have a hypergraph, and there's a relation between uh, points or data that exist that I want to exploit. It is the second one that I'm going to be mostly talking about, that is, residing in a relationship, relation space of, of your data, and then trying to answer questions in that space. And uh, uh, since I live on uh, genomics, genomics is omics, and genomics can refer to uh, DNA, but you know the omics family has expanded. Now you have expression values, you can have proteomics, you could have metabolomics, and we live in the world of omics. Okay, so, and that is the space I, I'll be sort of working on. And so this is the roadmap. So I will, I want to talk about three, uh, three omics sort of uh, spaces. Uh, one on population genomics, one uh, set on metagenomics, and one on what we call as phenomics. And I will take problems from each of these spaces and I will give you a background of the problem and try to show you how we try to answer some questions in that omic space uh, using uh, topology or TDA and where we believe that topology in fact gave us a better solution. So let me first start with the uh, population genomics. And, uh,
So let me begin with DNA. I'm sure all of you are familiar with DNA, but let me give you a very gentle introduction to DNA. DNA is your, the blueprint of all living things. But it says it's astonishing that, say, my DNA uh, is responsible for all the phenotypes that you see my height, the color of my hair, or my eyes, and in, in all the phenotypes, my state of health and disease, a lot of it. Of course, there's an environmental effect also, but there's a lot of, lot of it coming from my DNA. But also, my DNA is carrying the history of all my ancestors since, since the species began. So my DNA is my history book, as well as it describes me. So it's kind of a palimpsest. Uh, uh, that is, that the history is written in layers in, in my DNA. So this was, uh, that's why we, I'm calling it a palimpsest. And this was kind of the basis for a project that IBM was involved in some time back, you may be aware of it, which was the uh, genographic project. We teamed up with National Geographic and with uh, PIs from around the globe. And if I may say one kind of, uh, uh, in one sentence, what was the mission of the project? was to say how did humans, there is, there is common agreement that we as a species emerged in Africa and how did we populate the world? What were the routes that we were taking? And this is based on the genomic data. Okay. By the end of the project, we had uh, gathered a large number of samples. The project had two arms. One arm was uh, the public participation that is uh, for, for a small price, uh, individuals could send in their cheek swap, the buckle swap, and we would take that into account. And we would give them some answers like how their ancestors say, all the way from Africa, how they ha may have moved to the current location uh, they think they originated from. And the other uh, arm of the project was with PIs who had very specific questions, who knew which population to target or to sequence to get their answers, uh, questions answered. So these were the two arms which worked very well. The, the, the project ended with a large body of uh, publications and work as, as well as uh, data. So, so that, this is the background to the work and we kind of played around in that space for a while. So now I'm going to pose a problem here. So before that, I want to uh, give a little primer on what is the uh, population model that is generally used, a simple population model here. What I'm showing you here are, are the different rows of little circles, and this circle is, a, is an individual. And the bottom row is uh, the, uh, the extant individuals, uh, individuals of today. Each row is a generation, and the top row is, is way in the past. So the arrows that you see between these two rows is the transmission of genetic material. So each, uh, each circle that you have will have two parents. You know, say in this model, we are saying it's randomly chosen. So it will have two parents and the genetic material flows down, okay? And of course we are um, seeing here non-mixing of generations and so on. This is a simplified model, but it can be extended to a, a general model. And this is called panmictic because we allow uh, each individual at a generation chooses the parents randomly from this whole set. So this is a, a panmictic model. Now, if I look at only four individuals from here, okay, and track the history back, because I, I don't know about what's going on here when I'm looking at only this, uh, these individuals and I'm tracking the genetic material, the structure that you see in purple is called the ancestral recombinations graph. It's not a tree. It's uh, you know, it's not a tree because because we have two parents and there's a recombinations happen, right? So as a result, the the structure that you get is not not fully resolved, not complete. But this is the ancestral recombinations graph. I'll be talking about this arg or the ancestral recombinations graph, but I wanted you to understand what it is and where it comes from. That, that is, when you take and take a few individuals from the current generation, from extant individuals, look at the DNA and try to retrodict the past, if you can, then this, this is the entire history that you get in terms of uh, 
in terms of the flow of the material. So now the question is, of course, in part of this project, we reconstructed this. This, this, is, this is kind of re retrodicting the past and reconstructing the uh, ancestral recombinations graph. It's a complicated process, complicated algorithm. So uh, as you can see, we go through different parts of it. First of all, we, can, we reconstruct some small arcs. I'll call them arcs. These are not trees, but these, these are uh, a little baby arcs, recombination arcs. Then we do a calibration process because this is real data and so on. So it goes through the rigor of you know the statistics calibration process, and eventually what you construct on the top here is your um, ancestral recombinations graph, the best you can do with the data that you have. And in, so this is what this is. Let me quickly describe what this is. So this is under a simulation condition. So this is the African population, the, the blue dots and the um, yellow dots, the Asian population from here and the green dots from uh, the European population, grossly speaking. You can actually construct this art, which is very complicated. But if you zoom in, you can, you can see that these nodes actually, you can assign age or length to it, how far back you're going in the past and so on and so forth. So this is the details of this arc and this is what it looks like. And then you, you answer questions like we had started off, how did we populate the world? And you know you have some parts that has come out of the data you collected, the segments that you looked at, the uh, ancestral re recombination um, uh, graph that you generated. So now I'm going to pose, so this is the background to the work and now I'm going to pose a, pose a problem here. And the, and the problem is that if you have K populations and each population has some multiple individuals and, you, and the individuals are defined as a, a sequence of polymorphic sites or SNPs, what they're called. So we, we humans are very similar to each other because we are the same species. What we vary on is on certain, only in certain positions, which is called a single nucleotide polymorphism. So the variation between me and someone here, most of our DNA is identical because we are of the same species, other than the X, X chromosome, X, Y chromosome, the male female, keeping that aside, but our variations are only in positions and we focus only in these variations because everything else is the same, we look at these variations. So now if you are given K populations, and these ind individuals are defined by the set of variations that you would see pairwise or multiple wise across individuals, and you, go, you can ask a couple of questions. So one of the questions is, are any of these populations admixed? So now, now that we understand a population model, so now I'll try to say, what is, what is an admixture? That is when two or more populations interbreed or look something like this. So you had a panmictic population here. You have another panmictic population here. Panmictic, so you can imagine, you can imagine that they are inheriting only from that entire population. So they have some kind of a molecular signature, you can imagine. That is, they have a signature of these SNP variations. And, and these, this population also has certain variations. And when they admix, that is, these population get together, and now this palmitic, they're now choosing the parents from this entire range. And you can imagine that after a while, this signature of this population is going to be different. It's going to be different from this. It's going to be different from this. It should have some characteristic that says, I combined this population and this population admixture. And so now this is a question you are trying to, trying to address, that I give you K populations. Can you tell me? Um, if some of these are admixed. And there are statistical approaches, of course, um, uh, in uh, using PCA and uh, essentially looking at linkage, disequilibrium, and so on. There are certain characteristics. But I want to focus on what we did trying to bring in TDA to answer this, this question. So, so first of all, we want to define what is an ad admixed uh, population. And supposing I have the entire history, so these are four cases I'm showing you. So if I know the entire history, of course, we recognize that we originated, uh, we have a common point of origin. So, you know, so this is somewhere in Africa we originated. So we were one population at that time. And these are now different populations. 
we could have evolved in these different map, different ways. Okay, and we will call that by definition intuitively. You'll say that if if I have multiple paths to the root, then probably that that population is admixed. So in this case, for example, none of these are admixed. You see, they just evolved, kind of diverged in this path. Here, I would say that this is probably this is an admixed population because it has mixed part of this population with this population. So, so this is an admixed population. And the definition I'm giving it as multiple paths to the root, it'll become clearer why do we go for, why do we not just say that that's not a tree? I mean, if this thing is not a tree, clearly some, uh, uh, this whole structure is not a tree, clearly some admixture has happened. But I'll go to a second problem there is, so, so let's take this definition that if I have multiple roots to the, uh, multiple paths to the root, uh, then uh, it's an admix population. So we came across, so I wanted to solve this problem through using some other means other than looking at, uh, uh, you know, there are methods uh, or PCA and, and other things in statistics, which to me was an indirect way of uh, answering the question, very effective, it's very practical, very effective, very accepted in the community, but I, I thought it was a little indirect because you're looking at some other, other proxy. Of course, what we will do also is not direct because we don't have the entire history. We don't, uh, we can't go in and look at the structure, but I wanted to look at the, uh, the model uh, which has generated the data that we're looking at. And can we say, can we make that connection to the data, use the model that we think uh, uh, was underlying the production, you know, creation of this data and can we answer this question? So th there was this uh, paper by, Gunnar Tolson and Rabadan that actually inspired us because they talked about viral evolution and you know took one look at this picture and say okay they were looking at the difference between when you have a tree and when you don't have a tree where your topology was kind of answering the question about how the uh, viral evolution with uh, resorting and other things may have uh, may have happened so using inspiration from that paper so. I come back to my problem. So in, in that paper, of course, the distinction was, does that, does that exist a cycle or not? The problem here, of course, is now, is more, a little more complicated because this is the arc that I showed you. In general, this is what is happening. This is the evolution process. And this I imagine is a structure that has happened, which is not, not clear when we look at the arc, right? So this is an underlying structure there. And, And so actually each piece of this, because I drew it like that doesn't mean, so each piece of this actually looks like this, okay? And this thing, and there is this big hole, the big holes that you are seeing here, which is not apparent when you look at it, right? And now you can see where I'm going and I will try to uh, invoke topology to help me get these bigger circles. But remember that I have circles, these circles everywhere because of the combinations, these little circles are everywhere, okay? And this one, which intuitively let me call as the, the, the scaffolding of this, which is, this is the R P and this is a scaffold of P prime, it has these big circles, okay? So there's big circles here. And I'd like to use topology that can distinguish these, um, these big circles from these small circles. Uh, because the circles are always there and that is a distinction. That's where we try to um, invoke topology. And we have this theorem which says that, uh, if, uh, sorry, in the theorem we are using M and M prime, or in the figure I'm showing you P and P prime. So M is for P and uh, M prime is for P prime. So we say that for any, we, we prove that for any persistent homology cycle in the Ribs complex of M prime, if that is the scaffold, there exists a unique persistent homology cycle in the Ribs complex M, which is the R itself. So, so this, this mapping actually suggests that we can possibly use, use topology to distinguish these, uh, these cycles. The big, cycle, the big cycle, may I say, from the smaller, smaller ones. The smaller ones are ubiquitous. And the next layer of 
uh, approximation that we have to do is that we are given only leaf node surface, right? So we, so we have to reconstruct this arc, okay? And then make this uh, connection between uh, separation of bigger, uh, bigger circles from the smaller circles. So, and, and the other approximation we are going to say is that highly persistent homology, this actually is a fallout of the theorem. You can say that this is probably just the same as rewording of the theorem is that the highly persistent homology of the Vettori's rips of P, the RB is approximated by the persistent homology of the VR complex of the, um, of the scaffold, which is, which is P prime. And so you can either use the reconstructed R now, or you can use, again, another layer of approximation, which is the distance matrix. So we, we take the simulated and real data and look at the bar diagrams of, of, of these. And we stayed with actually looking at topological signatures in terms of we would look at the bar diagram signatures and try to separate the uh, uh, admixture from the non-admixture cases in this uh, slightly simpler models that we are showing here. And the applications, one of the applications we had was in plant genomics, where we were looking at different varieties of avocados. And of course, the interest there is who are looking at genetic diversity, is they look at these things and they want to know, are some of these actually uh, mix, mix, uh, mixes or admixture of some of the other ones that we are seeing? And that's of interest to them when, when they are actually zero in, your, in your genetic diversity and so on. So we use this algorithm to actually check that we could uh, we could say which were the varieties that were uh, um, admixed from the other ones. Of course, here we knew the answer, so we could actually verify verify that the algorithm was doing correctly and was pulling out the admixture uh, um, admixed cultivars of our garden. So now I want to move on to the second problem that I have posed. So you, and, and you want to know which are the admixed populations. So the first question was, are there any admixture populations? And you could do the signatures and figure out, given this set, um, you have some admixture or not. The second question you want to address is, who are they? And then this actually becomes sort of, um, oops. Okay. Um, my pointer for some reason is not working, but that's fine. I, I can just talk to it. So if you look at, <laughs> I find it hard to talk without it. Right? So. Yeah. So if you look at the second and the third case here, right, um, the middle two cases. And if I ask the question, who, which are the admixed populations? Thank you. I'm looking at only these, these mm -hmm. two cases here. And I say, which are the admixed populations? I could ask that question and my, I'll answer it myself. Okay. And uh, see here only C is, uh, C is admixed. Um, and here also only C is admixed. Okay, it looks like maybe D was admixed here, but actually D is not, although D is connected to this. And that's why we use this uh, complicated definition here. So if D were to be admixed, this is what it, what it looked like. So D here has a single path going up. So that this big circle curves, uh, you know, give rise only to one admixed population here, and you have these, uh, these two. So this is the definition for saying, uh, which are the populations uh, that are admixed? And we kind of use that definition in, in the bar diagrams that we use. So here we use the notion. So we have this bar, bars that we get, and we want to have a way of going back from the bars um, to the input that we get. So we use this definition of essential synthesis. And uh, this is with a collaborator, uh, Shogata Basu. And their paper has now appeared in Fox, um, this year Fox. 
And the, there is a definition there which we had been working on and we were actually using it even before. They have um, formalized the definition more. And the, uh, the idea here is that the essential simplicis actually gives us a way of uniquely going back from, in most cases, from your bars to your, to your input, which is what we need in all the applications that we do. Because uh, we do need to go back uh, from the bars to the data set. And uh, there is a notion of essential simplicis that uh, they have defined uh, that is useful for us. It may not work in most cases, but all the practical cases that we have, it, it, ha it has been working. And one of the conditions there has been that whenever new bars are generated at, uh, at some time t, you, you, want, uh, you, you don't want multiplicity at, at that time t. Coarsely speaking, that's a translation. And this has been working, and this is what we employ in most of them. And, and we use this actually to do some plots. You know, uh, there were different kinds of plots Stephen Shine had uh, shown. We have a similar thing uh, called rainfall like plot, uh, which is like the persistence diagram, except in the y axis, you are actually showing the uh, points of birth and points of death. A blue circle is the blue, uh, sorry, birth, and the red, red dot is death. So this is a different kind of diagram, different kind of visualization from which you can pick out the patterns of recombinations that could occur. So um, you can have very complicated simulation scenarios in which you use, you take the bar diagrams, look at the RFL plots, and try to get the signatures for which populations are at least. Okay, so now I want to pose another problem. And um, this is my summer intern. And yesterday when we were talking, this internship and other things came up, he's currently working with us. So we have spent, uh, we have not spent too much time yet on this, but this is a problem that we are working on. Let me pose the problem to you. And it's not solved. And I think it's a difficult problem, but someone maybe here has a, has a, um, has some ideas where the solution can be easy. So the problem is as follows. So you are given a 2D matrix, say, that looks something like this. And say this uh, matrix is uh, one and zeros and the black ones is one and white is zero. And the question is, find a shuffle of rows and columns of this one, such that you find some non-overlapping multiple occurrences of a predefined pattern. And I'll tell you what the predefined pattern is here is. The predefined pattern that we are going for is a triangle which is capturing, say, nesting, okay? So you have a triangle that goes all the way down, so that's kind of a nesting. And we are looking for multiple occurrences of this nesting in this input that you are looking at. But your answer lies in shuffle, because there is no meaning in this matrix to the order of the rows or order of columns. So you have to shuffle them and then you get the structure. In fact, this has two instances of the triangle, the nesting algorithm that we're talking about. And if we solved it correctly, and this is a canonical kind of uh, view in the sense you have this, you can have a random uh, ones and zeros, but you can sort them by the number of ones in the columns and in the rows, and you can, this is already sorted. So you can have in some canonical way, you look at your input itself. And then if, if you could solve it, and if you had the answer, you would, you would actually get these two triangles by shuffling the rows and columns, and you get these two triangles. And where is this problem coming from? This problem is coming, actually coming from the space of microbiomes, which I will talk next. But the tool that we are trying to use is, will some kind of topological signatures that we do on our input itself, without knowing what is the, uh, you know, what, what is the order of rows and order of columns, will it capture this? And the shape that we are looking at at this point is a triangular nesting shape. You know, it's a convex kind of a shape. You know, anything that nests is, is what we are trying to capture. And the tool that we are trying to apply, at least that's what, what we are trying, is looking for some topological signatures, like we did in the admixture. In the admixture case, topological signatures actually work for us. You know, you look at some bar diagram shapes and that was useful. And that's the direction we are looking at. But I don't know if it will succeed or not. And this, this is still kind of a, 
open problem, which I think is, is very interesting. And what is the solution that exists? So this is a problem. Yesterday I was asked the question that where does TDA work better than other methods and so on, right? And if you know, the current solution that exists in the community is only for a single, uh, single occurrence of this triangle. And it is simply done by looking at the very first metrics. You sort it by the a number of ones, sort the rows and columns, and you see a structure, and that's what it is. And then the computer distance are there, and they have it. When I looked at the problem, my question was, why do you look at uh, just a single nesting structure? You could have multiple nesting structures, but it is too complicated um, for the um, uh, for the users of this to think about multiple uh, multiple nesting structures. But I don't see why nature wouldn't throw multiple nesting structures at you. Uh, um, this, this is from the microbiome space. So, so I think the problem is real. It has not been solved only because it's, it looks too difficult. How on earth do you do it? And I think that uh, topology could probably help us in solving the problem. I don't have a solution. We are, we are uh, experimenting with topological signatures if, this, if we could solve the problem in this space. So with this, I will move on to the second omics I wanted to talk about, which is uh, from uh, the space of uh, metagenomics. So I'll give a little primer as to why do we care about metagenomics and microbiomes? Why should we be interested? And um, how does it relate to us? So I'll give a little primer on that, and then, and then I'll pick a problem from that space. Uh, we got introduced to this problem. The context of this is that we have been working on this problem because there are various projects that we have worked on, which is to do with sequencing the food supply. You know, you look at uh, the microbiomes in the food supply chain and also for healthy living and so on. So that's the context. We are involved in this in various projects that work on that answer, deal with microbiomes and answer questions there. Okay. So here's my little uh, spiel on microbiomes and why it is important. So we are born with the DNA or the genome that we get. That is called the first genome. And now more and more, the importance of this second genome, second genome is all the microbiomes that we carry on us, on our skin, on our forehead, in our mouth, in the gut, and so on. And that's been called the second uh, genome. And it is believed that the second genome is almost as important as the first genome. And some will also tell you it is even more important than the first genome that you're born with. And so what are the characteristics of the first genome that we are, that we are born with, that we get from both our parents? Uh, it has about um, 20,000, 20 to 20,000 uh, genes. And the second genome we inherit basically from our mothers when we were born. And uh, if not, it is acquired. Okay? And so this is kind of maternally inherited. The microbiome of the mother uh, has a big role. Okay? It, it influences, but as you go through life, you, you, could, you could change this microbiome. The other interesting aspect of it is that the microbe, if you look at the number of genes that these microbes carry, it's uh, one to two million genes, which far surpass the number of genes that you have inherited from your parents in your first genome. And the other argument that is made that uh, is uh, this is even more important because you can influence these, uh, uh, these genes. You cannot influence the genes as, as much. You can't, let's say at this, uh, at this point, you can't influence the genes that you're born with, but you can change the genes that, uh, that the, micro, the microbes we carry have. And there has been a shift that this gut microbiome is a linchpin, there are a lot of results. So uh, what is astonishing is in uh, say, maybe 10 years or 15 years ago when we were looking at this is that uh, in the 20 year span, cancer deaths fell, fell by double digits because we understood more and we could take care of, prevent cancer more. Uh, but while neurological deaths have increased by double digits, right? And there are, I, I'm just quoting here um, uh, some, some results, some highlights of uh, in this space, this notion of gut-brain access. That is germ-free animals have 
different gene expression in the amygdala in the brain. So the gene expression of germ-free. So this is animals, of course, can't do that to a human. So in animals, you're already seeing that the expression of genes in the brain is, is influenced by the, uh, uh, the microbiome in their gut. And uh, there are neuroactive metabolites like serotonin, dopamine, et cetera, et cetera, which are also produced by this. And when I talk about the third point, people always ask me, what is OCD in mice? <laughs> but I'm sure uh, researchers can see OCD mice and they, and they see that they have um, uh, shown that lactobacillus is as effective as uh, Prozac that controls OCD. These are animal studies, but these are indicating that what you can in your gut ha has, has an influence on that. And, and so on and so forth. So the gut microbiome is almost called the linchpin because it's got the second liver and the second endocrine and, and plays an important role. And there is a shift in what we say that even as a human, am I just an isolated human with my first genome? Or, you know, I have to take my entire environment into account. And there's this notion of a holobiont, like the, the Amazon forest is considered as kind of a one unit or the corals and so on. And even in healthcare, we are shifting from this aggressive war metaphor that we had in the last century is kill that bacteria, kill this, and kill. of course now with COVID, this may have shifted a little bit. We are interested in again killing. <laughs> Uh, but there is, there is a shift towards this uh, gentle gardener metaphor of you know nurturing your microbiome and so on. So it plays a big role in uh, uh, in health and disease. At least that is the current thinking. So giving that context, I I will uh, yes. So I wanted to give you the other of uh, the other thing that we have worked even on sequencing the food supply chain, where there is the microbiome that you want to study in your food supply and you know you can have microbiomes in the soil that affect the roots of trees and, and so on so microbiome in general this is not an uh, this is not an exhaustive list of where uh, microbiomes are used or studied but you get the idea that it is fairly important given that now i want to go to a simple problem from from the space of uh, from microbiome so which is that of signal enrichment. So let me briefly tell you what this problem is. So when you take a single organism, when you take a single organism and do the sequencing and get the reads of that single uh, individual, uh, say, say a human or uh, one organism, you get the reads and you have a single reference genome that you can map it on. But in the case of microbiome, it is an entire environment of microbes that are together. And when you are grabbing a sample, you are grabbing it from multiple species. And your task is now to go into a reference database and then map these reads separately. And the other challenge is that these organisms are very similar to each other. And what you often find is that the reads will map to multiple organisms. So you'll get a single read, and with high accuracy, it has mapped to multiple organisms um, in, your, um, in your database. Okay. And so there are different uh, bioinformatics ways of trying to address, address this problem. You try to figure out which are the reads that map uniquely, and you say maybe that one exists there, and so on and so forth. But I wanted to look at this problem and say, can we use topology here to get, to get an answer uh, to this question? So, so let me pose this problem here again. Uh, and uh, so this is a signal enrichment problem and this is what it looks like. So supposing you have three organisms, A, B, C. I show them as of the same length, but the problem is they're not of the same length. And that also contributes uh, to the difficulty. They, they would be of different lengths, although I'm showing you here uh, as their same length. And the reads, so you will have some reads. Uh, you can see some reads. Um, that map only to A, that map only to B, or that map only to C, and then there are reads which map to A and B, B and C, uh, and so on, and there are some reads which map to all of these, and there is a natural Venn diagram that you can think of, that, that your reads fall into these, these categories. And since these are reads, and I want to use the genomic information that exists, I will also, I will also have a notion of each set of reads that you uh, that mapped to say you have the reads that say mapped to A and B, 
but how much of A did it cover and how much of B did it cover? Okay. So there is a genomic coverage that also I take into account. So if I now look at my Venn diagram here, and uh, then the numbers that I will see at the intersection of these, I will have, if, if there is this AB, that is I'm looking at intersection of A and B, there are two numbers associated with this, which I'm calling as a DABA and say DABB. That means these are two different depths that is mapped here. So the way I'm looking at this problem is that, of course, the Venn diagram is going to be much more complex, right? You have many organisms and so on. Now I want to say that if I only look at these intersections that are there, is there a holistic story that I'm getting about what are the organisms that are present or not present? And, and can I sort of use this information and can I use topology here to help me solve this problem? So, um, of course, because in the intersection we have these two numbers, we resort to barycentric uh, subdivision here and we, we do the filtrations on this. With, with this here, the, the definite how it is done is shown here, but it's kind of uh, um, straightforward. So, I, I'll probably not go into the details of that. And in the interest of time, I'll move forward. And what the way we use this here is we do these bar diagrams, take the lengths of the bars, and I'll do a formula that I'm showing you here of voting for each organism. We have, well, I had showed you before that we could go back from the bars to the organisms. So, so each organism gets some kind of a score. And then the sig signal enrichment problem, you sort these by the scores that you get. And then you see in the top, top of the list should be your true positives bottom of the list should be your true negatives and of course on the spectrum. And you want to see whether your top of your list is getting enriched for the organisms, for the true or true positives or not. And we actually show with, uh, with some simulated data, a simulated data because we know what the results are and we do see this enrichment uh, happening um, at the, uh, uh, as we wanted it to in most cases. So I had a question that in, in my mind that uh, we are using a very complicated machinery of you know, doing the, uh, you know, uh, the barycentric subdivision, you know, do the filtration, pull out the bars and so on. Is it, can, I, can I get the same answer with less information? And so what I mean by less information is that I don't care about the genome coverage. The genome coverage is where it took us in the you know, barycentric subdivision direction because uh, we could not use kind of a, uh, we'll use a check complex as you can see here. So what I will do here is that I will ignore how much it covers. I don't care the size of the reads. I don't care how much it covers. I will simply go by the number of the reads. So here is an example I'm showing you here of uh, uh, four, um, four organisms. And you can see these numbers that you see in the, in the, uh, the Venn diagram here. And we'll use only that number. And we'll, go, we'll do the same exercise again, but this time we can just use a check complex. It's more straightforward. We use a check complex, we use the scoring, and then try to see uh, how much um, does it enrich or not. And I'm showing you the best result we had had. And um, the top greens, so this is the, this is the list uh, uh, in the sorted order by the voting scheme or the scoring scheme that we use, which is based on the lens of the bars and you know we have to use some other functions around it and the top green ones are the true positives and you can see that they are at the top and we compared it with uh, what we were using a method uh, coming from the bioinformatics method and their results are actually the blue ones which are somewhere somewhere at the in the middle but of course i'm showing you the best example it's not consistently it is not this but, but at least there existed a real case where, uh, where the um, uh, topology method actually outperformed uh, that. And not only that, I think we got more information from less. That means I used less information. I didn't use the fact that what was the part of the genome that was being covered and so on. So that is critically used in most algorithms, most other algorithms. And that was our first step in the, the first model that I showed you. But using less information with this intricate connection of you know, uh, how much of uh, overlapping there exists, 
we, we are able to get to the uh, correct answer. At least in one of the, with some of the examples that we I'm sure there could be cases where it may not work. So the, the final omics that I want to talk about is in the space of phenomics. And uh, phenomics actually has to do with all the searching and everything that you do want to do with the phenotypes. So the phenotypes could be say, uh, you have um, medical records and so on, and you have a lot of information that you have about, about the individual there. It could be height, it could be gender, it could be various other things, and, and other factors that actually affect the, maybe our health or disease state, what you're ultimately interested in. Could be blood pressure reading, BMI, and, and other factors. And you want to look at that space, of course, you want to combine with geno genomics as well. That's something that one does and we are also doing. But the ones that I'll focus today here is on the uh, phenomics part of this, uh, of the data that one uses. Awesome. So before getting into that, uh, this is a framework that we are working on with my collaborators, uh, which is uh, trying to bring logic and topology to for a framework of discovery on noisy data so these are the three uh, three legs of this tool if you may so you have data so data is very important i want to uh, solve practical problems right so we have data and i have topology on one end and i have logic on the other end we we kind of know how to connect data and topology very well and the audience here knows very well tda and the connection of data and logic there can be many, many ways of uh, making that connection. I am um, uh, invoking read descriptions, is something that we uh, something that we had worked on before, which is very simple, which you're just taking uh, ands and ors, maybe ands of different features, like you have feature A and B, you would say feature A and B and C and so on. So you have this very simple logical expressions. And the idea is to invoke persistence to uh, separating signals from noise. So, you know, so this is the frame of our model. This is work, work uh, in progress. I'm mean, very excited about it and hopefully I'll have something um, uh, more complicated, but I want to show you some, some simpler uh, applications of, of, this, of this framework in, in some of the problems we looked at. So you may actually, uh, recognize this figure that came out during COVID-19 and we were gradually, as we were all collectively learning about this disease, we realized that uh, uh, patients or individuals affected with COVID-19 had multiple symptoms. And there was this very catchy picture in, uh, in nature which talked about um, six, six symptoms and how different people have different combinations of these symptoms. And this is, this is an excellent picture which catches these uh, captures these numbers very effectively, right? And so when I looked at this figure, I said, is there more information about uh, that we can garner from what we are looking at, which is not obvious uh, pro from, uh, which is not obvious just by looking at these numbers. Can, can I, you know, the thing is we, we have been looking, we did the Venn diagram thing and sets and so on. And can we use check complex and TDA to give us something more than, than what it just shows. So I had a summer intern again uh, last year, I think, uh, uh, it, during the COVID time. Uh, and I got her to look at this data and to use read descriptions and see for us to get, produce hypothesis or produce some knowledge that we think is embedded in this data. So she invoked, so we went back to the data source uh, and there were about 1,500 patients, so it, it was not exactly this one. So and uh, uh, so we she extracted these uh, phenotypes, that, and we trimmed it down to about 31 phenotypes. So what I mean is that in the previous one there were six symptoms, so there would have been six phenotypes. So here from this data we get about uh, 31 uh, phenotypes she extracted from this data. So that you know some processing with. Uh, because uh, processing with this uh, um, Amazon Comprehend medical data because they were unstructured, uh, 
text information and, and so on. But, but the bottom line is we get 31 uh, um, phenotypes. Of course, there is an underlying Venn diagram, right? So these are the numbers that you see. These are the ICD codes that you are seeing. It doesn't matter what it is, but these, these refer to different, different uh, symptoms or different phenotypes. And then you have this number, number of patients that are displaying that. Of course, there is a complicated underlying Venn diagram that we don't even want to see. This does not reflect this. I took a stock picture about which was talking about how data can be very ugly. And uh, so we don't visualize this at all. We, we take the summary of it, but we don't need to visualize, right? We can go and um, uh, using check complex, we can go and get these uh, bar diagrams and so on, and then try to interpret what are the bars, the most important ones that we are getting uh, from here. And I am pulling out one of these. And if you, uh, and if you look at this, uh, symptoms. So you actually look at the bars and you go and interpret what is it that I got here? What was the most important bar? And what we, we had a few other bars too. So I'll take one bar. And we found that. So the, the hypothesis that you get out of this is that is there a distinctive signature showing alternative pathways between coffers and non coffers? So we found that even the disease ideology. It, the, um, this data was suggesting that even the disease is, ideology is different from patients who cough and from patients who don't cough. And this is, this is something that you don't get through logistic regression directly. And this is what you get through these bars. And then when you interpret, interpret this. There were, some, there were some other hypotheses also. These are top all kind of uh, uh, hypotheses that we were getting from this exercise. So we did a similar exercise with the UK biobank uh, data. And this time we are looking at uh, severe COVID. So from COVID, we take severe COVID. So, so remember, this is not in a machine learning setting, right? We are not saying that who is, uh, who is healthy and who is diseased. Can I learn from this? And you know, can, can I learn from what I have from the healthy, what is separating the healthy and non-healthy and so on? It's a, it's a different setting. Here you have all this data and you're saying, can you come up with a hypothesis that we can check and test with different mechanisms, but is there other hypothesis lurking in this data? So, so that's the space we are in. And that's where we are pulling out this hypothesis. So here we did a similar exercise with UK Biobank data. Uh, we took 16 labels, hand curated uh, labels, like we had 31 in the, in the previous one. And we go through this similar exercise here and, and we pull out some hypothesis. And one of these interesting hypotheses that we have here is that being obese doesn't make the impact of diabetes on COVID any more than without. What it means is that if I'm going to paraphrase it and may butcher it a little bit, you know, I'd rather stay with the precise statement. But what it means is that if one is diabetic and you want to see the effect of COVID on it, whether the diabetic person, person is obese or not, doesn't seem to have any effect, which is kind of contrary to what one would have thought. Again, this is a hypothesis, but this is a hypothesis that the data is giving us. We can take this hypothesis and we, we can test it out in a different settings and so on and so forth. In fact, we have a paper on, our, on in archive, med archive now, which is uh, also pulling out um, the pathways of, of the RAS and hyperlipidemia associated with metabolic syndrome conditions in this. And it is, and it is extracted straight from the, uh, from the phenotype data, which is not obvious by doing this kind of statistical regression and other models that one uses more straightforward. This is this uh, complicated way of getting it from this part. Again, it's a hypothesis which can be tested independently. In fact, the RAS association, we were seeing it, and then we also saw some papers come out, you know, um, making this connection, of course, through the, um, through the actual uh, biological uh, route. But here we were getting this straight from the um, medications and the phenotypes and all the, uh, the, uh, all the health records of these patients, of course, a large number of patients. So to, to summarize, I showed you problems from population genomics, from metagenomics, and from phenomics. And the tools that we were using were different. In population genomics, I uh, talked about 
and make sure, and I sort of posed an open problem in nestedness, and I think we should have a solution from here. And at this point, uh, I, uh, I think that just like an admixture, maybe nestedness has a solution to this topological signature method. You do these bar diagrams and you get some signatures and maybe that will suggest what you have. And in the metagenomics, I showed you a case where we use these bar diagrams, but we used a formulaic use of the bars. We took the bars, converted them to formulas, and then sorted our input and gave you the answer. And in the phenomic space, of course, you didn't. It, it, I mean, I, I didn't spell out the details, but I'm sure you got an, uh, you got the sense of it that we were trying to combine logic and topology to generate hypothesis uh, from uh, uh, from phenomics data. So, of course, a lot of the work is not possible without the hard work of of my team and my collaborator. I I'm listing only one of the collaborators. There are other collaborators in some of the work. And uh, Shogata Vasu from Purdue has been a very close collaborator uh, with all the topology work that we are doing. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions for our last one. What is the oldest data you take into account when studying uh, this human population problems? Um, the the human population, the data is always from the present. Okay, so you make some simulations from this data, right? Um, based on the question that we are right. So uh, one was the R reconstruction. So we try to retrodict the past. So that the phylogeny construction, like uh, Shine was mention mentioning in a different context, th it is the phylogeny construction which tells you what may have happened in the past. And so the data that we have been dealing with uh, is always uh, extant population, current living population. And uh, we take that data and try to say what may have happened in the past. Okay, thank you. Other questions? So for this uh, human population, you have two kind of uh, like uh, data information. One is is the phylogenetic uh, information, and the other like in COVID is the activity the population activity information. So in some sense, uh, you can compare uh, two types according to their genes, and the other one when you are a uh, case study something like COVID uh, pandemic, then you are using these uh, symptoms to like classify this patient. How you can compare these two types of information? So one is like the intrinsic information between people, and the other one is whether they uh, share some kind of symptom. So how you can compare these two types? So uh, I think what you're saying is that uh, that is this interaction network you know, so people do study interaction network of population for contagious diseases. So, so how people are interacting with each other and and uh, and how the virus is transmitted. So that's an interaction network. And then uh, uh, and then there is a host genome that you have. So well, uh, uh, yeah. So you can study host genome, the virus and the host genome interactions and data is being collected as we speak regarding getting the host genomes and the, uh, the viral genomes were being collected independently of that. You can actually study host and viral interactions. And uh, there are a few papers already talking about it, but the data is not rich in terms of having the uh, host genome information as well as the, the viral information. And the network transmission is more in the, uh, the transmission of the disease and this contact network is more in the space of uh, epidemiology and epidemiologists are studying these, these networks. Computer science is having a big influence on that because they can deal with these large networks and how to model them and how to start uh, making epidemiological kind of uh, predictions, the curves that you used to see. Um, many fields, many people are looking at various things. And what I was talking about here was mainly not talking about the viral uh, genome at this point. So the, the viral uh, genome is, is yet another way of, another axis of looking at it. What I was talking about is from the symptoms, uh, symptoms and the phenotype information that 
your physician is collecting and putting in the database, right? So we go and look at that thing. And when you look at a large such data, can you infer what is happening in the patient from this phenotype data? Of course, it is more powerful when you bring in genome data, but you, you need data for both genotype and phenotype and fairly large uh, at that. UK Biobank is one such uh, bank that is collecting, and there are others. There's a, a New York Genome Project, which is also collecting the genomes of uh, patients of individuals along with the uh, viral data. Thank you, Lakshmi. So um, I think in the interest of time, I would suggest to postpone the questions online for the coffee break, uh, because we have another session starting in uh, 23 minutes. So let's thank Lakshmi again. So, so next to talks will be some primary talks and then we'll have lunch and then we'll have a break. Let's have some coffee. So to the last part. Okay, so there is one quick request. We will have main coffee by the reception desk. And then there is also a coffee machine, but it's mostly dedicated for the speakers. So don't don't, don't you buy the coffee machine to be addressed. Yes, and it's also you can be used for the demo coffee. So the main coffee is by the reception. So please please go ahead over there. Okay, that's right. And let me also put on this. Well, the third part. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in terms of the first 